What's up, everybody? Justin Ocho back with another episode of the Gym Sessions podcast. And today we have on Jim Klopman of Slack Bow Balance, the maker of, got one right here, the Slack Block. Uh, one of my favorite training tools, trains balance specifically, but a lot of other benefits to it as well that we get into during the show. Now, in this episode, we talk about what balance is the differences between balance and stability, how to train and enhance your balance. We talk about how to test it. We talk about how to quantify it. And we talk about some of the myths of balance training and how you guys can get the most out of your balance training and why it's so important. Now, Jim is an expert in this field. He's written books on the topic. He's developed products that are in this realm. And he's a a really just a great guy to talk to about some of these topics. He he thinks outside the box. He's very into the research. He's very into the brain and his opinions and his thoughts that he brings to the industry are always innovative and in pushing the industry forward. So it's always great to connect with him. This is probably our third or fourth chat that we've had over the last year or so. And I'm always learning Every single, every single time we talk, I learn something new. Even in this episode, I alluded to something that he taught me that I wasn't supposed to talk about. And so um, you guys will see that, that kind of funny interaction during this episode. But yeah, this is episode 13, Jim Klopman. I really hope you guys enjoy this and get a lot out of it. Jim, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate you inviting me. Thank Absolutely. You. So before we get into the topics that we have on today's menu, as far as you know, balance training and all that good stuff, uh, why don't you give the audience just a, a bio on who you are, what you do, and a little bit of your expertise? Yeah, my name is Jim Klopman. Uh, I wrote the book Balance is Power. And I guess over 10 years ago, I decided that um, balance was kind of the hidden agreement, the, the hidden secret to all athletic performance. So for the last 10 years, I've just focused on that. <clears throat> and I'd say for nine of those 10 years, I've been sort of uh, not well accepted in the strength conditioning community because they didn't see it as such. But um, it's been pretty clear now in the last couple of years that they're tracking with it now. Mm-hmm. And it's become much more of a popular topic. Um, and I... Once I wrote the book, I opened a couple little gyms and developed more of the process and ended up developing equipment that supported the, um, the thinking about how to improve athletic balance. I like that. So I've, I, I've actually got one of your inventions here. We're going to talk about the, the slack block, something that's pretty crucial in my program. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about Slack, slack Bow, um, your company, and kind of how that started? Yeah, it it started. Oh uh, gosh, I'm seven, God, more, it was almost twenty years ago when I went skiing at age fifty with Stein Erickson, who was seventy four, and he skied really well. And I've been skiing since I was three, so I mean I could keep up with him. And and, and I'm not a world champion skier like he was in his twenties uh, and thirties, but I had no problem skiing with him, you know, turn for turn. But I wanted to ski that well into my 70s. And I asked him what he did. And he said, well, one thing he gets to do is ski every day. And I said, I can't do that. And we talked some about what it could be. And, you know, he still did some of his gymnastics training, which seemed to have a balanced focus. Mm -hmm. So I left that day and I said, well, how can I do this? And, you know, strength and conditioning, the community you're in, you guys have really done a great job of, you know, keeping us strong well into our older years, so to speak. So I knew it couldn't be strength. It couldn't be vision because you can buy better vision and it couldn't be skill because generally the more you do something, the better you get. It's pretty simple. So what was this component that caused people to kind of give up from skiing and walk away from it? And I determined it was balance. So I went out into the fitness industry to find out what was available in terms of equipment and methods in balance. And there was almost nothing. There was a BOSU ball, but back in those days, you could only have it round side up. And it wasn't a balance challenge. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like you trying to build muscles lifting three pounds every day. Yeah, you'll build up a little bit of muscle, but eventually you're just going to be wasting your time. So what was a true challenge? And then I saw the balance boards, which I had been on since I was six, five years old. And I've been great on them since I was a kid. Uh, My dad got one for the family and I was on it all the time. So that wasn't a challenge. So what was one? And 
Finally, one day I got on a Slack line and said, holy mackerel, this is really hard. And it dawned on me that that was a good balance challenge because it seemed to engage my whole body. And from that point, I, I thought, well, there, there really is nothing in um, athletic performance where one foot is in front of the other like you are on a slack bow, I mean, slack line. You generally have your feet apart like I do in skiing. So I started training one foot and then the other foot back and forth. And I went out and skied that year and my mind was blown. My first day, I was rocking faster than I was my last day of the previous season. So I knew it was something special. So I tried to develop a device. And finally, after two or three years of working with Auburn University in their engineering school, I came up with a device. And then I tried it out on a variety of different athletes, just 12 minutes, uh, uh, 10 sessions, so 120 minutes of intervention. And every one of those athletes increased their vertical leap by over 10%, except for one who was incredibly high to begin with. He increased mm -hmm. by 8%. But there was no other change to their, their protocols that they were doing otherwise over that. It's over maybe a two and a half, three week period. So I thought, wow, this is something special. And when I watched those guys, were they all guys? Yeah, there was one girl. When I watched those people do it, when you watch them before pre-intervention jump up and hit the little Vertex fan, and then you watch some post-intervention, it was amazing to me that they looked so much more fluid and more athletic. It wasn't like there was more strain. It was almost like less strain mm. caused them to go up and hit that. And so I determined, I guess, at that point that it's like, wow, you you can't do anything without improving your balance. That's all there's to it. You cannot get any better in any sport uh, beyond that of what your balance system allows you. It's that simple. And it's just proven itself over and over and over and over again through the years. Change of direction, speed, vertical height, vertical jump, skiing, uh, golf ball, distance, accuracy, everything gets better when you improve your, what I call dynamic athletic balance. And that's a pretty specific term. That's awesome. No, I love that. I love the, the backstory there. And, you know, you and I have kind of talked about this over the past couple of months and some of the, the views on balance training and in, in my world and kind of how you view it from your perspective. Uh, before we even get into that, I think maybe we could go with some type of working definition of balance. You know what I mean? Like what is balance? What does that mean? And how can we use that one definition to kind of get the most out of what we're actually doing to develop it? You know, you, you sent me that question before this conversation and I thought about it. You know, I have a definition of balance is that it's this system that's all encompassing throughout the whole body. So it's not just the vestibular system. It's just not the proprioceptive system. It's your eyes. It is your vision system. It is your proprioceptive system. It's your, uh, your, your ability to map every part of your body. Your brain has a map of every position your body can be in. It's that. It's your tongue. Your tongue is involved in your balance system. The bottom of your feet have 100,000 to 200,000 receptors. You have, it's just been recently discovered, brain tissue behind your lower spine that takes data, information from the lower extremities, takes that data, manipulates it, and sends it back down to the feet and the legs that has, relates to stride, distance, and power. So, it's this huge system that's there. And then looking into it even further, you know, when you collect data into this whole system, it's manipulated not just in the brain, but it's manipulated all over the body. So to me, it's this totally encompassing system that you have absolutely over, no control over. So it's impossible to fake bad balance. It's impossible to improve your balance just by sort of willing yourself. You know, when you lift weights, you can sort of force yourself to get a little bit more out just by willing your body to do it. I can, you know, on my autonomic nervous system, I can change the blood flow in my hands. I can breathe faster. I can breathe slower. I can change my heart rate. But your balance system, you can't control at all. It takes a massive amount of data from the body and manipulates it in the brain. And I think it, they're saying now it takes up a massive amount of the brain's activity is this ability to keep us upright and mobile. So that's the, my definition. The, the, you know, there's, there's other definitions. You know, I picked one up off of, oh, I forget the name of it. Um, vestibular.org. It says a properly functioned balance system uh, allows humans to, to see, and I say, and feel clearly while moving 
identifying, uh, oh man, I put on my glass. <laughs> Mr. Word. I know the feeling. Identifying orientation with respect to gravity, determine direction, speed, and movement, and make automatic postural adjustments to maintain posture and stability in various conditions and activities. I mean, that's a great definition. And that's at vestibular.org. I mean, I would put in, it's more than just seeing. It's what you feel. It's what your body senses as well. Yeah. Um, a spinoff question of that, and and you and I have kind of discussed this, and you taught me something about balance as it pertains to vision, and that obviously being a huge part of that system, that, that all-encompassing system. And I think a lot of people misconstrue uh, training with their eyes closed as balanced training. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? And then I have another follow-up question for you in, in regards to vision and balance as well. Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, the snide hot take to that of uh, balancing with your eyes closed is just, you're just basically training yourself to be a well-balanced blind person. <laughs> so you, your eyes, your eyes collect data. They don't see your brain sees. So, in fact, when you see my hand, that's only 5% of the data that's coming into your eyes. The other 95% of the data goes to all the parts of the brain I don't talk about publicly, but your brain, your eyes collect a huge amount of data, and it's manipulating it all the time. And they say up to 40% of your brain could be used to manipulating this data that comes in through your eyes. So this data is involved in your balance system. How you learn how to use this data affects everything you do in terms of how you move in your sport, up and down the basketball, basketball court, everything you do is this is information that's coming in through this system that's being manipulated and passed on to the rest of your body. Now, people will say to me, well, I know blind people who have good balance, and they do, but they've done enough research to say that blind people, when they're blind, and there's a couple of different types of blindness, but when they're blind, that part of the brain, those parts of the brain get repurposed and use other sensor, sensory awareness tools in that part of the brain. So the other data collectors suddenly now get more data. The hands get, you know, I'm sorry, the data is used more, used more in the brain. So what comes from the hands is used more in the mm -hmm. brain. What, the data that's collected by the ears is now used by that same system where that system was all used for vision before. Makes sense. So the follow-up question is, is about color. And uh, we've talked about, you know, the, the blaze pods and some of the, the Hico sticks and, you know, I'm, I'm all for tools and, and I've used those tools in the past. And I think if you want to find value in them, there's, there's ways. Um, but something that you taught me about your peripheral vision as it pertains to picking up color or not picking up color kind of changed the way that I use those tools because it's, it's not doing what we think we're doing. Uh, you want to kind of dive in on that for me? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, <laughs> we'll keep that Cause, private. Cause I don't want to be critical of anybody else's product. Got and, you. you know, I think what I, what I know about that is, is proprietary. Right? I got you. Okay. That's perfect. No, I'm, I am keeping that in there though. I'm, I'm sure you weren't expecting that <laughs> answer. <laughs> Well, that's fair because you weren't expecting that question, so uh, you know I tried to try to sneak one in. Yeah, I, right. It wasn't on the I list. I tried to sneak one in <laughs> on you. Um, try to give give the audience a nugget, but uh, I will, I'll keep this in and I'll let them kind of take it how they want to take it. Yeah, no, it's fine. The, the data is out there. You yeah. can research it um, and do your own research and come up with a a finding. So, um, yeah. all right, let's talk a little bit about um, balance and stability. So we've got a working definition of balance and a lot of people will use these two terms and as one. So, you know, somebody who's on balance is somebody who's stable or, you know, I work on my balance. I work on my stability, uh, but they're different right. in ways. Can you talk about the difference between balance and stability? I, I guess they are. So again, looking at that question last night, I looked up as many definitions of that as I could, because I see stability too. And I don't like the mm -hmm. term. And, you know, I feel like, um, like Peter Atiyah uses stability, like he's operating from a higher level of, of information that it's, it's stability. It's not balance we're talking about. So, you know, when, when Kyrie's sort of zigging and zagging down the court and put, putting all the other feet on their back, all their players on their back foot, uh, no announcer ever said, look at Kyrie and the great stability he has. Right. Look at the great balance he has. So, 
you know, balance is a much more universal term in terms of how the body is handling the forces and changes in forces that's either applying to itself or being applied by somebody else. Stability to me is a, you know, a four by four box sitting on a table. It's stable as much as, you know, what, what we forget is as much as it could be stable other than the fact that we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour on a ball that's traveling through space at 146,000 miles mm. an hour. So there's, there's a degree of stability and then there's, you know, different ways of looking at stability. But no, I, I don't use the term stability at all. I don't think it conveys what it is. You know, did you lose your stability? No, I lost my balance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how does, that, how does that golf swing look? Oh, it looks stable. No, it's, it's a balanced golf swing. I like that. It's a good way of putting it. And I think that kind of differentiates them just by using it in a sentence and, and hearing how it comes out of your mouth. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, when you look at balance, well, you, you, go ahead, go ahead. Let me just add more. One you, you're, I mean, it does, you don't see it as much, but back in the day, you know, I'd say, well, I, I, you know, I develop and help people balance system. Oh, you mean the proprioceptive system? Well, not really just that. Oh, you mean the vestibular system? Well, really not just that. So, you know, it's sort of this thing about trying to pull balance into a bigger pile has become, and I, you know, I believe it's because of what I've been doing over the years, but, you know, that's just my own ego talking, but it's gotten away from, oh, work your vestibular system, oh, work your proprioceptive system. It's gotten to, hey, it's your balance system. And like I said, if you want to sound cool and smart, you know, you'll use the word stability if you've got an MD after your name, but really it's... Um, it's not an operative term for me as far as I'm concerned. Got you. So when you look at balance, uh, what are some things that maybe you personally or uh, coaches listening can do to, I guess, assess it, identify it, test it, uh, quantify it? What are some, some things there that we can talk about? Yeah, you know, it's, there's balance tests out there. So there's the star balance tests. We've kick your leg out and get in different positions. And, and I was at a, uh, a, what do you call it? A combine camp last week training one of the top quarterbacks in the country. And they had one of those there, but you know, I took his dad over to it and I showed him, I said, you can cheat on this and perform, you know, better here, better there. You know, Greg Cook's got an assessment system that has balance as part of it. There are, uh, there are systems out there, but most of them are static in nature and, you know, we just do the, the, the simplest thing, and you don't need a slack walk to do this, is just stand on one foot in an athletic position, barefoot. So you basically have your knee over your big toe. The other leg is maybe one foot length to two foot lengths behind the grounded foot. And then just lift that back leg one inch off the ground and stay with your knee bent. Again, athletic position, not bent over, not in an RDL, but just that other foot's just a, like a couple foot lengths behind that grounded heel and just stand there and see how long you can stand there. And, and so, you know, a lot of people will go, Hey, look at me. I got good balance. And they do something for five seconds, but where are you at 20 seconds? Where are you at 30 seconds? Where are you at 40 seconds? Then you're like, Oh, I get it. And you start to feel the, ba the body really be challenged by it. And um, I think that's one of the best places to start. You know, the other things you can do in general is, is, uh, Anything you do where you go outside on a trail, out in nature, all those things improve your balance. And, of course, sports will improve your balance, certain sports like skiing or golf. Skiing because you're always on uneven surfaces traveling at you know rapid rate of speed. And golf because you're never on a flat surface. So you're always judging everything mm -hmm. based on the incline of your surface and the, you're on and the incline of the surface you're hitting on. That makes sense. That brings in that visual component, too. And because you're, you're standing yeah, and no shoes, by the way, I don't know if I yeah, said that. for sure. And, and you like going back to the golf element, you're standing on one surface. That's one way. And you're trying to hit the ball to a completely different surface. That's another way. Um, same thing with nature and, and being barefoot in nature. Uh, the elements are chaotic. You don't know what you're going to step on a rock, a twig, a piece exactly. of uh, whatever. And I think exactly. that, those small increments of, of balance introduced to your system just build you more options. So uh, I like that. So no doubt about it. going back to kind of balance training and, and some of the things that, that are effective, um, 
and ineffective. Let's talk about first. Let's talk about some of the things that are are ineffective or inefficient in balance training, and then we can talk about some things that you can do to get more out of that training instead of, or maybe in addition to doing those things. Can I switch cameras? Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. We got the, we got the good setup now, man. I love it. I love it. (laughs) The, uh, you know, one of the things is that um, you always have to check and make sure your flies. <laughs> Anyways, one of the things you see a lot in terms of balance training are, um, you know, the Romberg position, which is kick this leg out in front, right? And you'll put your hands on your hip. Well, as soon as you kick that leg out, this knee is straight and I'm on this heel. And that's just never a position you're in in real life. I don't even like pistol. People show me pistol squats all the time on the slack block. And I'm like, good for you. When do you use a pistol squat or anything close to a pistol squat when you play any game? Maybe occasionally in skiing you get down that low, but you're pretty well braced by your boots and you can pop back up. But I don't know of any position in sport where you can do that. So I'm not saying the Romberg position is not balanced. It truly is balanced, but it's a different kind of balance. Uh, the other is, of course, yoga. You know, the, the tree pose where you wrap your hands all up, you put your foot there. Great. Same thing if you look at my knee, it's kind of canted out. I'm on the outside of my foot. It's straight. I'm back on my heel. I, I, don't, I never want to have my leg in that position because I'm going to tear something up. So to us, it's true dynamic athletic balance. So the first step in the process is it has to be athletic. Boom. What's the athletic position? So for us, we just do the three hops. One, two, three. I'm in the athletic position, right? That's the position I'm in when I train dynamic athletic balance. The other is it's dynamic, which is I'm not doing this. So some people believe balance is just from the waist down. It's not. Um, I've gone through and, and trained on equipment that just says, oh, it's just from the waist down. And they try to keep my upper body straight, and I can't balance on it. And then I say to them, well, hey, can I use my upper body? They say, okay, you can use your upper body. And I beat all their records Mm. because the upper body is engaged in the whole process. So true dynamic balance, if you want to develop equipment, if you want to develop any methodology, is you just have to look and see, does the whole body have to move to stay up? And the third part of it is that we do it on one foot because we just believe that I know from, you know, we have a patent on this. We also have a patent on two slack bows, thinking, oh, one next to the other is just really great. You know, double your, double your pleasure, so to speak. It's not true. Once you're on one slack bow, and as soon as you t- step on that other line, you just stand there all day long. It's like standing on the right. ground. So true balance is not what you're doing on both feet. Even if you're on a teeter-totter board, and we have those too, you're shifting your balance from side to side. So we just train all one foot. And this is something we can do that apes and chips can't, chimps can't do. Just to be able to stand like this for more than a few seconds is remarkable. And you can't get an ape or chimp to do that. One reason is that they don't have big toes and they don't have the glutes that mm-hmm. we have. So they're not designed to do it. So in the in mammal kingdom, we're the only ones that can stand like that. So dynamic athletic balance. So I'm going to be on one foot in a nice athletic position and I'm going to allow myself to be dynamic. Got you. I like that. So, um, Kind of as a follow up to that, if we're talking about, um, I'm trying to think of an example, like on the slack block, for example, right? Let's say I got my left leg on it. Is it best to just let the rest of the body do whatever it's going to do to keep me on that and, and not take away any of those additional components? Like I've seen uh, some people squeeze a ball between their legs while they do it. Some people go hands behind their head, whatever. So you're saying just let the body do what it's going to do, and and that will develop your balance. Well, you know, I think in all of physical fitness, in all training, isolation is 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 starting to is starting to sort of fall away. Mm-hmm. You know, it used to be isolate this muscle group, isolate that, isolate that muscle group. So it's sort of becoming obvious that that's not necessarily a great thing to do. But I'm going to show you, um, because I see this. I have, um, you know, different athletes will, over the years, train with them. So I'm going to get on this, and I'm going to lock out my shoulders and my arms. So lock out. Okay. Here I am locking out. You know, I could be doing this, whatever it is. But I'm going to lock all this out. 
So I'm going to get up here and watch my body. And I'm really good at this. So I'm locking out my arms, locking out my shoulders. It's really hard to do. See, my whole body's not even moving naturally. I'm moving like a, a, a person who's got real lack of coordination. Arms, shoulders, locked up. And it's really hard to stay up there. Because I have taken this out of my balance formula. I've removed it from my balance formula completely. Mm -hmm. Why do that? I don't play my sport locking out one section of my body. I always have everything moving fluidly to keep myself in balance. If I'm doing a fallaway jumper, I'm not going to shoot from where I shoot in front or if I'm shooting a free throw, right? I'm shooting from the side a little bit. You know, who knows? But so the point is, I'll be in all sorts of, I'll be in all sorts of different positions to be able to balance. Now, if I get up here and I have no tension in my shoulders and my arms and I allow them to all move freely, it all changes. It's much more smooth. And that looks athletic and graceful, which is what good athleticism looks like. You know, there's a, I worked with a golf pro uh, recently and just talking about putting. And I said, give me your routine for lining up a putt. And he went through this whole scenario of getting his feet just right and picking out the line, picking out the slope of the green and which way the grain was going and all this stuff, standing over and getting all the little lines on his putter all lined up. And we were just doing a four-foot putt, and that's how he put it. That's great. Now let me show you what I'm going to do. So I got over it, sunk one like that, sunk one like that, sunk one like that. That's what the body's supposed to do is is – Allow the body to make decisions, and that's what happens when you train with balance. So if you're artificially trying to lock something out, that's not allowing the body to do what, it com what comes naturally. My balance training system, I'd probably make a lot more money with clients if I just said, go ahead, get on here, and the body eventually will come to all the right decisions. I just know what the right decisions are so I can speed you through it. But it, it, it's fascinating. If you allow the body to make the right decisions – Balance will get better, including all that vision stuff I was talking about. I don't even have to tell you the story about vision. Your vision gets better the better your balance becomes. Right now in the NBA, I think um, three, of, three or four of your best players in the NBA, you'd be shocked to have the best balance. And they also have the best fielders, and they have the, they're the best passers in the NBA. You know, one's Luca who uh, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you know this, but in the NBA, they have like 30 cameras over every court. Mm -hmm. So they know every movement of every player. They got incredible analytics. And Luca uh, was able to um, decelerate faster than any other player in the NBA. And if you watch him move, he doesn't seem to be doing anything fast. Right. But he always seems to be sort of faking out the other player because he, he gets them going in a direction, he stops, and goes in that other direction. He doesn't do any, you know, razzle dazzle fast move. Um, <clears throat> and then you watch his passing. His passing's unbelievable. The other is to watch, and I watched 30 minutes of him last night. Is um, oh, what's his name on Denver? Jokic. Oh, Jokic. Yeah. Watch him pass, but watch him move. He's a giant. He doesn't do anything fast, but he's just so graceful. And then he's just like this. Because he's got great balance and he knows where everybody is and what they're doing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge component to everything you do is to have the best balance you can possibly have. 100%. Yeah. Uh, just for what it's worth, I think I'm, I'm probably uh, faster than both of those guys, <laughs> if I'm being honest. And, but if I ever exactly. got on the court with either of them, they make me look like a child, like just silly. So... It right. just goes to show, right. you know, some the how they use their body and how their body um, is able to to like with Luca. My biggest thing for him is he has more options than anyone. So, and I'm right. big on options. I'm I'm big on options. Like, right. you know, how many different ways can you complete the task? I think the more options you have right. there, the more solutions you have there, the better right. you're going to be. And right. I think right. Luca, right. Right. he has infinite options, like infinite options. And and that's yeah. why I love him, love yeah. his game, because it's like yeah. you never see him do the same thing twice. Well, watch Now when you watch him, though, watch how fast he decelerates. Yeah. And this was, you know, this is not, 
something I observe. It's something that they pick up through their metrics, you know, through their cameras that are they're picking up all that. They came back and said he has he stops faster than anybody else in the NBA. He's unreal. Um, all right, so we've talked yeah. a lot about balance training and, and balance in general, but I want to talk specifically right. about some of the ways that you train balance and, and that's with the slack block. And so I've got I've got a handful of them at the facility. We use them every day. I love them. Right. Great product. But right. I'm probably still scratching the surface on what's possible with these things. And so uh, let's talk about some right. of, you know some of the best use cases that you that you uh, as the right. inventor would recommend. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the hardest problems with the Slack block in general is that um, people. I mean, I don't know. It, it, there's just not a lot of action. There's not a lot of movement. There's not a lot of stuff going mm -hmm. on. So, you know, even, you know, get just people to do the 12 minute routine, which is just two minutes of attempts in three foot positions uh, with each foot, and and you're like, oh, okay. That's pretty easy, but then you can add a component to that if you need to, in that, you know, get about 10 to 15 percent of the body weight and get up there and now hold this. And you go, okay, that's not too hard. But about 10 seconds in, you go, oh, wait a minute, that is hard. My center of gravity's changed, everything's moving around, shift hands, now my center of gravity changes again, and how does my body respond to it? It's huge. And I mean, Already, I'm starting to sweat just from that little bit of work. So just even doing that is important. The other thing that's I think I found with athletes is that they, many of them have great upright balance. You know, they have great balance here or here. But what kind of balance do they have here, here, when they got to get low? Mm -hmm. Are they comfortable getting low? I always feel like in, in basketball, you watch somebody like Steph, who's got great balance. Kyrie, the same thing. Watch how many times they get low. They get really low to get around people sometimes. And I think everybody can get really low if they want to, but to be able to do that, you have to have great low balance. And I know Steph practices a balance work. I've seen some of his video from years ago. I kind of know something about his gym. And, and there is balance built into his training system. But So my point is, if you have low balance, you're more likely to go low to play your sport. So a lot of people will get out there and put the slack block on the ground and they'll put a weight out here and do a Roman deadlift and roll over and try to get it. But that's not balance because, again, that's not an athletic position, right? Right. Knees straight, weights on the outside of the foot. But And I, I have to stop talking when I do this because I can't. I have to concentrate <laughs> to do it. But I'm going to drop down and pick I'm going to drop down and pick that up. But in order to drop down, I have to lower my – I know this is a technical term. I have to go down and lower my ass down into a deeper and deeper and deeper squat on one leg. Otherwise, if I try to bend over for it, I'm not going to get it. Yep. And the other thing is you'll learn when you do this is that you'll find out you have to have, it's a secret, I guess, amongst us, you have to have a certain sort of vision when you pick up the, the weight as well. So if you watch me, I'm going to see if I can do this sideways a little bit more. I'm going to drop down, pick this up. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough. It's really it's hard. really hard. Like I've really I've tried hard. it. I've failed it. I've got it. You know, depends on the day. Like some days you got good balance. Some days you got bad balance. Right. Um, something you said, getting right. low, right. is is such a overused term in basketball as it pertains to basketball because people I didn't know that. people didn't don't know, that. know what they mean when they say it. Like they just say it because they want an athlete to to do exactly what you just um, demonstrated, but but they're not telling athletes that are capable of getting in that position, if that makes sense. So it's like like yeah. telling somebody to get low, but they can't. Like they, So they need to work on stuff no, like right. this yeah, yeah. to be able yeah, yeah. to achieve exactly. that position. Right. So, um, right. I mean, that, right. the, the whole point of what basically I was trying to say is like, 
the purpose of doing that is so when your coach yells at you 48,000 times a game, get low, get low. It's like, and you feel in your head, like you're the lowest you can be. It's like, you got to work on this stuff to be able to actually achieve those positions. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I will, I mean, I did, again, I was working with that quarterback last week, a couple of quarterbacks and, you know, we were doing this and people think they're getting low. And I actually have to take a photo of them and go, here's me and here's you. And they'll get to like here and they'll think, oh, I'm getting down low. And I'm like, no, look at me. I've got, I'm on this, whatever this bone is in my leg, I'm almost parallel to the ground by the time I get down there. And you're not. And they don't know what low is because they don't want, I mean, time and time again, whenever I've done this, I've had to take, I say, here, take a video of me. Take a video of you, and you show them where you are, and then you show them where they are. And I said, that's what we're talking about when I say get low. It's really hard to get in the brain what low is. Absolutely. No, that's a great point. And uh, even to follow up on that, it's it's going back to those options. You know, if you practice this and, and you do it in different positions and things like that, your body is going to not perceive that position as a threat. And now – you can get low. Now you have the ability to actually achieve that position in context in the sport. Right. 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 No, you're you're exactly right. And when you say threat, that's the right word because the body's saying, I don't want to go there because this is a bad place for me to be. This is a dangerous place for me to be. So I'm not going to go there. And I mean, that's a great way of describing it. It's a threat. So that kind of stuff is, you know, whatever you can do to work them to go low, I think is, is going to be a big help. Um, so something you said, actually, uh, I, I wanted to follow up on this, and that is kind of, uh, I think you said, so basketball players will have great upright balance, and then you bend the knee, what happens, or you keep bending, what happens. Is that something that we should be doing? It's training balance in different positions, different angles, all that good stuff, rather than just staying on the slack block for two minutes uh, on each leg in three different positions, but actually getting lower or getting into an angle or twisting, whatever the case may be? Well, twisting I wouldn't do too much. I mean, the twisting's built into the the protocol. But, you know, going down and picking up the weight is certainly um, something that uh, should be – you can do that during the two minutes. Mm -hmm. You you don't have to do two minutes just standing in the slack. I'll go ahead and do two minutes of uh, doing weight. I think I have a basketball around here somewhere. The other is you can – let me get this. Here we go. Oh, I got a more pumped up. <laughs> for some reason, for a guy who doesn't play basketball, I have two basketballs in my place. Um, but, you know, if you get on a slack block and balance, you know, how well do you do this? Mm-hmm. You know, how well can you stay up there and balance and go down low and balance? Can you go down low and balance? Can you get up and balance? And again, I suck at basketball, so I should be doing that whole by him. <laughs> yeah, let them know. You got the you got the balance. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I suck at basketball, but that's not easy to do. So and that's one thing you can do for sure. Right. Same as with, you know, pass and catch. You got someone on the slack block. Yep. And make sure that they're catching and passing without looking at the ball. Because if you start looking at the ball, you're not going to have good balance. Mm, because uh, your your vision should be on the field of play or, you know, in space to pick up more data. Broad. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. I mean, ask great, ask great shooters, what are they looking at? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You looking at the basket? No. What are you looking at? I don't know. Don't, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> no, that's a, don't make me think about that's it. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. A lot of a lot of people are. I know it's a real thing. They're like, uh, do do you look at the ball or do you look at the rim? Like some people are like, oh yeah, if you watch Steph shoot, when he releases, he, his eyes go to the ball. And some people are like, oh, when uh, KD shoots, his eyes are on the I rim. Have no idea what his eyes are. I don't at. think anybody knows. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody consciously does that. Sure, maybe he he does watch the ball, but I don't think he's trying to think about doing that. I know. I know how they're doing it. I know how they're doing it. Like I said, I, I won't talk about it in front of your 
your guess, but I know how it's, what's happening. And it's, it's, it's very clear to me, but I know as your balance improves, there's two reasons you're shooting gets better as, you, as your balance improves. One is if I'm getting ready and I've got my body all set up to take off, if I go off and I'm slightly off balance when I go up, I'm going to be slightly off when I shoot. Right. So I just want to be able to, if I'm going to take off, I want to take off from that position that I know where I am. I don't want to get ready to take off and lose my balance slightly and take off to a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And when I shoot, I'll be a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. So, I mean, I don't know. If you want, I was just thinking, going back to we're talking about where they're looking. I, if I played basketball, first thing I'd tell the guy I was guarding, I'd go, man, you're really seeing the basket well tonight. You're really seeing the basket perfect. <laughs> just get it in their head. Just get him looking at the basket. <laughs> I like that. Oh. Yeah, I'm seeing the basket. You know, everything's going this way, that way, this way. Yeah. I like that. That's a little uh, trash talk 101 right there. But it's not trash. You, you're telling him a good thing, supposedly, but he doesn't. All right. That, so. so here's something. Uh, here's something strength coaches will often say, and – kind of a rebuttal for balance training or a rebuttal for using a product like the slack block or any other similar right. thing. Right. Right. They'll right. say, but the sport is played on, on the basketball court, not a slack block. And to me that the, you and I both know that that makes that logic makes no sense because we tell them to lift weights and you don't lift weights on the basketball court. We tell them to do X, Y, and Z and they don't, <laughs> You see what I'm saying? The, it 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 doesn't yeah, make yeah. sense. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. But what is your re, what is your response to a coach that says, "Well, how does that work on balance? We we play on a basketball court." EVA foam. Those soft, shitty shoes you wear in basketball are all made out of EVA foam. So starting off to begin with, I love it. <laughs> those soft, mushy shoes are already made out of EVA foam. So don't give me yeah. that. And, you know, right now, there's, I think the Bulls are practicing in zero shoes, these shoes. So you've got teams that are practicing in these shoes. Zero structure, zero height to the heel, zero foam. And that's what they're practicing. Um, I put up a post last week of the four Miami trainers all wearing these shoes. I mean, one guy says he has 14 pair of them. So trainers, what would they know, right, about performance? <laughs> right. I'm being facetious, <laughs> but they they're all wearing zero shoes. So, you know, I've, there's a great picture, a photo I have. I, I got it. I think it's on Instagram of, of um, it's two things. One, I've got a photo of a short video of Derek Rose. Who I think, you know, when he came into the league was clearly the best athlete they've ever seen. Yeah. But he immediately did a deal of $242 million deal with a shoe company that had never made basketball shoes before. And then he went on to have a career full of just shitty problems with his ankles. And this video I have of him landing, and he did slightly sprain his ankle. You can watch his leg comes down, and his foot on that foam shoe goes boop, 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 as it's crushing out. How could you hold the ankle stable when all that crap's going on underneath you? So to me, you know, <clears throat> they... They should practice balance as much as possible and then get into those shoes. And I've had, I won't name companies and I won't name schools, but I've spoken to trainers at, at schools, Division One schools, and I'll go through this <clears throat> description with them. <coughs> Excuse me. And they'll go, oh, we know that, and we agree with you, and we hate our shoe company, but we can't tell them no because they fund the coaches, you know, salary, they fund everything in this program, and we can't tell them it's the wrong shoe. So there's a lot of that going on. So to me, you know, getting more in contact with the floor is a good thing. But when you get on these things to balance, it's everything you do in sports based on balance. I'm trying to get the other guy off balance. That's all there's to it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move him around him. And, and finally, the thing I say to coaches that say this to me, I'm like, okay, I don't want you to believe me at all. I ask you just, you know, two things. One, do your players have the best athletic balance that they could possibly have? I don't know. So how can you tell me if it's good or bad if you don't know what their balance is? You can't say it's bad or nothing's happening if you don't even know if you're not even testing them for it. And we have a testing protocol that we have at one school right now, and they've come back and said, everything's true. As soon as somebody gets a higher score, they perform better. They have fewer injuries. And we test them every week or every couple of weeks to make sure the score stays the same. 
The second thing I'd say, what are you going to lose if you just spend uh, over the next three weeks, three, four hours balance training, the right kind of balance training, dynamic athletic balance training? What do you lose by doing that? And you'd have to say, well, nothing. I lose nothing. So, you know, I, I, there's no, it's not like building muscles take a lot of work. Building endurance takes a lot of work. Building up good dynamic athletic balance does not take a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, it's the perfect warm up. Like before you go on the court or into the weight Best. room, because what I've found is you're, you're getting all of those elements that we talked about, um, you know, the proprioception, the cognitive, you know, the, kind of the, the, right. the visual, right. and it's all right. blending kind of the physical and mental aspects. It's getting you ready, but you're also getting the benefits of the actual balance training. And then you can go hit the court. Yeah. Or hit the weight room or whatever the case may be. I've found it to be just like yeah. a perfect yeah. warm up. Yeah. I'm trying, can't remember his name now because I'm old. Um, the guard for the Phoenix Suns, the older guy. Oh, uh, Chris Paul. Yeah. He gets on a slack block before every game. He's out there sitting on it, shooting on it, playing catch. So, yeah, it's, it's incredible warm up. I mean, we've had, I mean, I said it already in this podcast so you you'll get on it and just world-class athletes will get on it and within a 30 40 seconds they go well i'm sweating and i don't know why I'm sweating. Yeah. and you're sweating because you're engaging everybody in the body every small muscle in your body is firing so you're not doing big mobilizer work these are all the little tiny baby muscles that kind of position and hold everything in place yep yeah no i love it i i uh i mean you know i love it but it's uh it's a really good product and you know people got to tap into stuff like this because at the end of the day man there's there's only so much you can do when you get bigger stronger faster and you do the traditional route and and that takes a toll on your body and how what are you going to do to support that newfound speed that that new uh vertical jump pr like you have to be able to yeah. handle those yeah. new yeah. outputs so that's where i think this yeah. has been yeah. great for my athletes now it it's so true, but that whole strength paradigm is still hard to get around. I mean, I had a, a guy comment the other day on Instagram. He goes, well, my son tore his MCL or, you know, strained his MCL. <clears throat> what can I do to strengthen his knee? And I'm like, pretty much every athlete who gets injured is strong. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like <laughs> It's not like, so you just can't say, oh, he's not strong. He plays, you know, 180 basketball games a year. Or he's not strong because, you know, he's a professional athlete. They're strong. So what's happening? And, and you know, the story I tell is um, I spoke to a D1 foot, football trainer coach years ago, head of strength and conditioning, and he said, you know, we're going to get the slack blocks. Tell me what's good about it. And I tell him the whole balance performance thing. And he goes, what else? And I said, well, we're getting reports. And this is true. We have one Division One uh, basketball team that came back using the protocol and the device, and I feel like I'm selling the device here, but honestly, God, don't use it. You know, I'll give you a link to go do some things without the Slack block. I just want you to get, you know, tracking on it. But um, he said, we've gone to zero ankle turns. We've had zero ankle injuries. And so this whole stability control mechanism gets improved. So I was telling this to this uh, football coach, and he goes, oh, yeah. He said, you know, we're, next year we're going to do this. We're going to work this muscle group. I'm going to work that muscle group. We're going to work really hard to prevent all our ankle injuries. And I said, oh, I said, I said, you know, the problem is you build up all those muscles, particularly in these younger kids, and you're really putting a lot of power and force on undeveloped tendons and connections and bones even. And I said, you're really asking for catastrophic breaks, I think. And, and I know you're a strength and conditioning coach, and you see everything in terms of strength and conditioning, but... Right. And there was this long pause on the <laughs> line, and he goes, God, last year, he said, we had three tib-fib breaks. And I said, that's what I'm talking about. You, you, that's, that's an over-muscled body that doesn't know how to control those muscles. It's like taking your little tiny Toyota Corolla and dropping a Ferrari engine in it. It's, unless you improve the tires and the brakes and the suspension and, and even the frame and the steering, it's just a bad idea. So to build all this muscle without improved control, and I wish your industry would rename themselves to the strength, conditioning, and control coach because you need to start to learn to develop the body's control systems as well as improve strength and as well as improve the conditioning. I completely agree. And like you said, I, I know you're not the, I know you're not the type to, to be like 
trying to sell all the time, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of put, I put you in that corner, but let's talk about some of these alternative ways. Let's say that people don't want to buy a Slack block or any type of device. What are some things that you can do at home or in the gym that, that you can work on this stuff without any well, major equipment? Well, I mean, I'll give you the link that comes with the Slack block. I mean, I gen I created this just for the owners of the Slack block, but in, in it, the second video has a lot of floor-based stuff. So it's slackbow.com slash sblock, S-B-L-O-C-K. And on there is a video that takes you through a initial test, which all of your, all of your viewers will get. And pass will take you through the different levels of training that you can do. And, you know, one of the simplest things you can do is just take – Instead of using a slack block, just take a couple of beach towels and fold them up into thirds and stack about that much of, of towel and get on that. And it's an unstable surface. And it's different than the foam surface for some reason, but it's still unstable. Mm -hmm. I will say, because you deal with athletes and athletes aren't always deep thinkers, someone's going to go, hey, let's make it really big. <laughs> and so I was doing it one day with somebody and I had it stacked up six towels high and I was on it. I'm like, hey, this is pretty cool. It's really good balance challenge. They got up on it thinking not – I wasn't thinking at all. The whole thing's not stable. Kicked out from underneath yep. her. She went on her ass, bruised her ass. So it, don't go any higher than two towels is what I'm saying. <laughs> I know you, though. You'll probably go in and try the six for the hell of it. But if you do, I wash my hands. A yeah, you got, you got evidence right here specifically telling me and others not to try that at home. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Uh, so transitioning a little bit back to balance training, uh, I do want to throw you into the hot seat here in a bit, which is just, you know, rapid fire, yeah. like random nonsense questions. Yeah. But is there anything yeah. balance wise, balance related, you want to get off your chest that we didn't hit today, um, as it relates to balance training? No, I mean, I've covered it. I mean, I just, I just think that the simplest premise is, um, you know, how do you think it would hurt? <laughs> you mm. know, how good is your balance and, and, what, and how does it hurt you by improving it? It doesn't. So. It's very true. It's very low stress. It's very low volume. Uh, it's, it's exactly yeah. work right. it in. And at the very least, right. uh, you'll get the other benefits of the exercises as well. You know, some, some calf training, some foot right. training, like right. whatever you believe in, you'll, you'll get that. But yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of, right. of this stuff and enjoy the work that you put out for sure. Well, and one thing I also say is never balance train or weight lift. Don't try to weight lift and balance train at the mm. same time. It's just, you know, it's sort of does not help either one of them. And, you know, we use weights just to be asymmetrical and, you know, have weight on one side of the body or the others. But if you're going to do, you know, bell, you know, bars over your head and things like that, balance training. It's just, A, it's it's pretty dangerous to have a whole bunch of weight over your head um, to begin with because if it falls the wrong way, you're in bad trouble. But if you're trying to balance and have all that stuff above your head, it's just not good. It's patently stupid. It's a good way to get mm -hmm. injured, so don't do that. 100%. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> – that's how we met in the first place is like uh, balance train – and weight train. Let's not mix them together. Uh, they can both be great yeah, right. on their own and, and be synergistic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So let's do the hot seat. All right. So I got some random questions I'm going to throw at you. Just kind of some fun ones. Okay. All right. I'm ready. Here we go. Have you ever had any inventions fail and never see the light of day? I mean, I have inventions that I haven't brought to market, mm. but no, not yet. Okay, that's good. What is your all-time favorite movie? Oh, God. It changes all the time. Um, I don't, God. I saw one the other day. I said, that's my all-time favorite. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a. I'm a fan of those stupid romantic com romantic movies like The Notebook, but um, I I can't remember what was the movie I saw the other day. I said, it was an old old movie. I said probably I said my all time favorite is one that was made in 1935 called The White Suit without Guinness. 
he uh, worked at a textile company in England when it was all sort of coal fired and it was black and dark. It was a black and white movie and everything's dirty and coal dirty. And he worked in the lab and he fell in love with the owners of the factory's daughter. And he invented this fabric that stayed white all the time and you didn't have to wash it. So he created this fabric and he's walking all through town. It never wears out. And he's the hit of everybody, loves him, and the daughter falls for him. He's just the hero of the town until the owners of the factories in town go, so this fabric never has to be washed, and it lasts forever. How long do you think we're going to be in business? I like that. And before you know it, <laughs> he went from hero to bum yep. immediately. And the only reason I like that is when you talk about what I've been doing, the American way is to work hard. And so what we do is so simple, and you've done it. And the results are so phenomenal that you know you just feel like I'm not supposed to get better that quickly with doing a little bit of work. I got to work hard to get there. So that's a nice little well-rounded answer. I'm gonna check that movie out. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if you know any other languages besides English, but if you could learn any any language that you don't currently know, what would it be and why? Well, I know, I mean, I know a, lo a little bit of Italian just because it sounds good and, and I like Italian people. And I don't know, I think I'd be a badass talking Italian all the time. That's all. I like that. That's solid. <laughs> all right. If you had $1 million to spend by the end of the day or you had to give it back, what are some things that you would buy? Things I would buy? Mm-hmm. That probably have to buy things for myself, right? I can't buy things for my kids and my grandkids. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah. Spend all my money on my kids and my grandkids. So, um, for myself, I, you know, buy a couple of ski trips, um, buy a, a, a car that maybe I like, you know, something really, all the selfish kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But other than that, I mean, you know, I give, half a million dollars each of my daughters and their families and they can do what they want. With nice. Um, if you had to go one year without electronic devices or one year without a vehicle, which one would you choose? Probably electronic devices. I mean, just because, you know, I need to <laughs> I just <laughs> It'd be nice to get away. I mean, a few times I've done, you know, long excursions out, you know, I haven't done it recently, but out of contact with the rest of the world. Um, they're just great experiences. And I think for a whole year, it'd be frightening, but cleansing at the same time. So. For sure. All right. A couple more. Um, <laughs> this is such a bad question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, how much money would it take for you to get a face tattoo? I don't think I would. I don't know. You know, man. I mean, I have to laugh because, you know, my ex wife's son is a tattoo artist. Oh, yeah. And he is head, face, neck. And she has a couple tattoos. And I even have a little tattoo. Just, I don't know, felt like I should honor his art. Um, but um, my ex wife just got one on her face. <laughs> Really? Yeah, right here. And she said, you know, just supporting my son. Awesome. She's a pretty woman. I thought she was crazy to do it, but he is just about everywhere. I think this part of the space is almost not touched. But yeah, I don't think I, yeah, a lot of money and I just give it away to somebody <laughs> for sure. That's crazy. That's a crazy background story though. I hadn't literally had no idea. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, last one here. What's the unhealthiest thing that you've eaten in the last, like, couple months? Well, I, Whole Foods has this uh, root beer that's supposed to be good for you. It has probiotics in it. and but The label lies. It's, it has two grams of sugar, but then you find that there's apple juice sugar. In there. Mm, have it. Yeah. It's only two grams of sugar. It has two grams of cane sugar, but there's all those other sweeteners in it. So... Um, Man, I love a root beer float. So I, I make my own ice cream, but it's healthy ice cream. Lots of egg yolks, reduced sugar, you know, heavy cream. But I use regular old Haagen-Dazs vanilla in my root beer float. 
And I, I've built my body such that if I get an insulin response to anything, I get sick. Mm -hmm. So if I eat something sweet and my insulin kicks in, um, to, you know, compete against that overload of carbo you know, glycogen that comes into the body, I feel sick. So it's a great place to be. So I've, I'm pretty careful about going too sweet. Yeah. I'm kind of the same way. I, uh, when, like, I, I don't, I don't go too crazy, but when I do, um, it's like, it's bad. It's overboard. And I can, I just feel it and like almost immediately. It's like, that was right. not worth it, but it kind of was. So here we are. Almost to me, yep. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Jim, I appreciate your time and taking the time to go over this stuff with me and dive in on balance training and, and slack block and all the good stuff that we talked about. Where can uh, where can everybody find you, find your work, and find your products? Yeah, anything that anything that says slack block, slack bow is going to be me. Um, there's a few websites that refer to hunting bows that go slack but you know if you type in slack bow s-l-a-c-k-b-o-w um it's instagram facebook on the internet wherever that's where we are got you i'll link that up in the show notes make sure everybody uh has access to that stuff and once again i appreciate your time thank you and that was episode 13 with jim klotman of slack bow balance creator of the slack block awesome device that I love to use. And then also the uh, author of Balance is Power. Um, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please like it, share it, leave it a review on whatever platform you guys are listening to. Go ahead and leave Jim a comment on something you learned or something that he said that resonated with you. That way he can go through the comments and, and see how big of an impact he's making by doing shows like this and making products like he is and spreading information like he is as well. So again, episode 13, Jim Klopman, great talk there. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And I'll see you guys next week for another great episode.